Okay, so um, I learned that once the music is turned off, the stage is mine. So this means the stage is mine now. Um, it's a huge stage, actually. Welcome to my afternoon presentation about um, approaches to ultra-long-term system maintenance at the Embedded Linux Conference 2016. Uh, my name is Wolfgang Maurer. I work for Siemens Corporate Technology in Munich for their um, corporate competence center Embedded Linux. Of course, I guess um, in Germany everyone knows what kind of devices Siemens is building, medical stuff, uh, infrastructure stuff, um, power distribution, transmission, and so on. So um, all kinds of industrial devices that are supposed to last for a very long while. And that's, um, of course, one of the reasons why we got interested in maintaining systems for ultra long um, um, term time ranges, so not just five years, not just 10 years, but 20, 30, maybe 40 years a while ago. Um, let me use this opportunity to also mention the civil infrastructure platform, a recently founded uh, initiative of the Linux Foundation that deals with precisely these problems. And we have a booth in the first floor where we showcase some of these uh, ultra long term devices and we'll happily tell you more about the initiative in case anyone wants to join our efforts. So what's my talk going to be about? I will speak about architectural aspects of long-term software maintenance. We've heard already some talks about um, the more component-centric questions of long-term software maintenance, um, about how to provide Linux kernels in the long run, about how to fix security issues in um, packages that have been deployed for decades. But I'm going to take um, a little wider view of the whole issue and consider not just the component-based level, but really the whole system design and architectural uh, questions, which are, in my opinion, crucial. When I was preparing this talk, and that's so um, I felt obliged to put up a disclaimer right at the start when I was preparing this talk. I thought, yeah, so um, we've given consideration to these issues now for more than a decade that I've been, or roughly a decade that I've been working with Siemens. We've spent a lot of time thinking about these issues um, when we founded the civil infrastructure platform. And so I prepared the slides and I was reading through the slides and then I was thinking, okay, hey, all the stuff that is on the slides is really obvious actually. So there must be something wrong with my slides. I didn't think the topic through enough. Um, I'm going to bore the audience for like half an hour with stuff they maybe already know. But then again, I thought when we look at industrial systems, most of these uh, topics that are fairly obvious to the Linux community are completely non-obvious to traditional system builders. So now, depending on where you come from, what your background is, if you've been doing a Linux kernel development for the last two decades, and um, if you speak more to GCC and to Git and to patch stacks than you do to external customers, then stuff maybe will be obvious to you. But on the other, high, um, on the other hand, if you come from the traditional businesses, from the traditional infrastructure businesses, then I guess, or I hope that most things will be quite, um, quite non-obvious to you and provide some, um, uh, some ideas on how to improve your development processes, your development, your architectures for long-term system maintenance. So what are we talking about uh, when we think of um, software-centric appliances these days. Of course, we have, on the one hand, the traditional consumer electronics devices. We've already heard in a number of talks that mobile phones, notebooks, tablets, and so on are not something that you, of course, would consider to be relevant for long-term uh, maintenance. And we all know um, two years is more than enough uh, time for the lifespan of a mobile telephone. Of course, if you're as stupid as me and drop yours into the Pacific Ocean, then it's even less than two years, but that's an exception. Uh, we also have entertainment systems that are quite software-centric these days. We have things like ovens, washing machines, home control devices, home automation devices that become more and more popular and that, of course, also rely on software that are very user-centric, but 
um, see much increased, greatly increased lifespans compared to traditional consumer electronics devices. Because if you're building a house, um, at least if you're building a house in Germany, then you plan for the house to last for maybe 20, 30, 40 years. And in these 40 years, you don't necessarily want to replace your home automation every two years like you do with your mobile phone. On the other hand, we have um, industrial systems and the uh, classes of systems that we are looking at are fairly different. It's maybe medical devices, computer tomography, X-ray imaging, ultrasound devices, with infrastructure devices, gas, wind, um, uh, gas power, water supply, with power stations, with energy distributions. But we also have things like um, park space management that uh, requires more and more software. We have mobility, we have uh, planes, trains, automobiles, of course, Mars Road over space stations. I was thinking of uh, removing this space station thing, although everyone knows that space stations need a lot of long-term software. But then I uh, just received this image, uh, which reminded me that actually the um, next generation that may live in space stations may be your own offspring. So uh, we definitely should care about the software quality in these um, appliances. When you think about long-term maintenance, there's, from my point of view, two fundamental questions. The first question is, when you look at your appliance, does it really make sense to uh, make this, to provide long-term support for this appliance? Because there's, of course, always alternatives to supporting a device for 20, 30, 40 years, which I'll talk about, and that is uh, the first question that you should be asking yourself, is it really not just doable to support your device over such a time frame, but is it also reasonable? Are there no uh, alternatives? And if you come to the conclusion, yes, we want to support our device over decades, then the second question you need to address is, what is the most appropriate system architecture for long-term maintenance? So you shouldn't think uh, on a component level, you shouldn't think just on a kernel, um, or what not level, but you really, sh you really need to be thinking about the system, about the overall system architecture. The types of lifespans that we consider just to um, get the picture for consumer devices, they are not for long-term maintenance, it's about two to five years. Mobility devices like cars uh, already have a much greater life expectancy, maybe five years is even a little short unless um, yeah, you're running very special cars, but 10 years, 20 years um, is more the expected lifetime here. Industrial systems range between 10 and maybe 30 years, if you think of manufacturing plants and so on. And infrastructure systems, so the area where the uh, civil infrastructure platform, of course, is most interested in take this to very extreme levels. 30 years um, is certainly um, not a very long um, time of existence for power stations and when you think of water supply, um, power lines and so on, then 80 years is also maybe even on the not so long side end of the spectrum. What unifies all these domains these days is that of course all um, or many of the devices run Linux. Uh, that goes without saying on an embedded Linux conference. But the thing, the interesting thing that has happened during the last years is that the long life requirements that we face with such devices are these days not only um, seen in the industrial environment, but I've mentioned examples of home automation and uh, smart cars that run Linux. They are also they pervade more and more into the consumer electronics sector. And um, in my opinion, if you, look at, um, if you look at developments like the Internet of Things, Smart Home and so on, then you um, maybe can start to think that the short lifespans that you face in traditional consumer electronics are becoming more and more the exception to the rule and maybe not the rule itself. So long lifespans, longevity of devices will more and more become a case that people will need to deal with. Thanks, Mike. So the fundamental questions that are associated with long-term maintenance. Uh, so when, or let me let me phrase that different. Then you look at systems that you need to maintain for decades. Then, of course, um, you need to update these systems. That is substantially different. 
to traditional engineering, if you think, and to traditional engineering that used to be current not so long ago, if you think, for instance, of photographic cameras. A camera that you purchased 30 years ago will these days work exactly in the same way as it did 30 years ago. You maybe pick up difficulties um, with getting films for the camera, but you can take the camera out of the box and it works same thing for a camera that you purchased 90 years ago. So, okay, it's black and white, but um, the basic operational principle is still the same. Um, today's devices are all based on software and that means for some reason we are not yet able to create the software with the same quality, with the same longevity that um, traditional devices used to be built and software, as you all know, requires updates. It requires changes, it requires continuous modifications of the device over its um, lifetime. Because if you look at a modern camera with Wi-Fi support, with um, support for digitally exporting images, the thing for sure won't run in 30, 40 or even 80 years time. So, um, updating devices, changing devices in field has become a necessity that cannot be avoided. And with every change, with every, every engineering change to devices, there's of course risks involved in updates. There's also benefits involved, but there's risks involved. And if you want to minimize these risks, then there's basically two very simple questions that you need to address. The first question is, how can we restrict updates to very specific areas of the device. So in case any, uh, something goes wrong, only this particular area um, is being concerned, but not the rest of the device. And the even more important question is, how can we avoid updates? Um, there has been this growing belief uh, in the industry that, and uh, with uh, consumers that every problem that a device um, observes can be fixed with updates, but I think that's uh, one of the major bogus or wrong assumptions that underlie this whole update, uh, everything update in very short uh, time frames thing, because um, updates don't tend to fix more problems than they create. In fact, uh, if you look at the statistics, updates are really a major problem, a major source of problems these days. Um, the sec same assumption that um, is wrong is that all components can actually be upgraded. That's, of course, for consumer devices, but the more you go to the uh, traditional industries, the more your devices um, will become very, very involved to be updated. Um, another bogus assumption is that uh, we've heard a lot of times now, or, uh, or we, we, we keep hearing a lot of times that upstream integration of changes that you do to systems um, reduces your maintenance if for effort, uh, leads to better products and so on, which is of course right in a very large um, set of circumstances, but it's not always right, and, um, especially when you come to the more arcane corners of, um, of the industries, like the VME bus, for instance, that is used in uh, many industrial uh, control appliances, then if you are the only remaining um, user on this planet, maybe except particle physics, but uh, they also don't count very much um, in these communities, if you're the only remaining user and nobody else than you benefits from um, improvements in the field, then bringing stuff upstream also won't automatically lead uh, to less problems uh, in your own appliances. So, um, what's important when you design long-term maintainable systems? As I said, it's not about components, but it's really about the whole architecture. So, you cannot um, address all questions of long-term maintenance by simply installing long-term support versions of your components and be done. That just doesn't work. It would be nice if it were, but it just isn't. What long-term maintenance is all about is two things. It's for one, architectural issues. You need to design your systems from the ground up in a way that it supports long-term maintenance and you also need the proper mindset of the developers, of the people designing the system to be able to bridge the gap between the long-term requirements of the system and the um, school of thought that the components, the software components that make up the systems um, entail. I said in the beginning that it's not um, 
always appropriate to go with a long-term maintenance strategy. And of course, there's, there is an alternative to long-term maintenance, and that is to periodically rebuild your devices or parts of your devices. Just take them out and replace them with a new appliance that may be um, cheaper than going for a full long-term approach. Just think of um, a power station that has an information display somewhere. The traditional German way of engineering such displays is to make them last for 30 years, to make them so sturdy that uh, 27 North Korean tanks can roll across the appliance and it still will work, but is that really always a reasonable choice? No, it isn't, because if you take a standard display that you purchase for 20 euros, then the North Korean tanks come rolling, destroy the thing, and then you just replace it. And the same goes for the software. If the software experience is false, if you get problems with the software, then you just replace the component. That's way cheaper than designing the whole component to last for 30 years um, in the first place. The decision criteria that I like to use to distinguish between long-term maintained systems and systems that are periodically or aperiodically rebuilt, um, I've summarized up here, and basically it's these four um, questions that you need to think about with your customers, with your system designers. The first and the most important one is what kind of software runs on your device. Is your device running a fixed set of software that you can trust, that you provide by yourself, that you are in full control of, or is your device able to run basically arbitrary payload software? Of course, with uh, mobile phones, the whole point is to run arbitrary payload software like apps. When you're building a, a nuclear reactor or a power station, then there is a certain trend in the industry to allow apps to be run on these devices or to allow apps to be run on medical devices so um, that doctors don't become too bored when they have to wait during surgery or something like that. But um, I guess that's a question for the software architect that really needs to be addressed by them. Does it make any does the device get any benefits from being allowed to run arbitrary payload software? And that is quite often not the case. And if you restrict the software load on your device to fixed and trusted software, then um, uh, things get a lot easier to maintain because you reduce your attack surface by quite a bit. And that is, uh, in my opinion, um, one of the uh, most important preconditions for building successful long-term systems to only or mostly run fixed and trusted software. The second question that needs to be addressed is how is the device accessible? Of course, in the Internet of Things, everything is universally accessible by, some, uh, by a network connection in some way or another. And the trend um, in industrial appliances is also to make these devices more and more network enable, enabled. Just think of um, uh, cooking ovens that uh, these days have an Ethernet connection or heatings um, um, or um, yeah, heaters that have an Internet connection. The question again here to ask that's, uh, that needs to be asked is does it really bring substantial benefits to put devices on the network? And is it really a smart idea to put my MRI machine on the network? So what benefits do I get and what problems do I buy? And as you all know, most uh, of the security issues, most of the problems with devices come with network access. So by isolating these devices, which doesn't mean you cannot access them, you can provide ports that are physically accessible, you can provide local network connectivity and so on, but just think three times if it's a really good idea to put your um, precious appliance into the internet or not, and then most of the times you will end up on this end of the scale for really um, long-lasting devices, and that, again, simplifies things a great bit. The third question is about hardware stability versus variance. What I mean with that is how long will the hardware that your appliance is based on be available from the manufacturers and um, for how long will you be able to build up stocks, to build up supply stocks uh, that you can use to uh, replace faulty components in the field. Again, it's uh, quite astonishing how much problems come from a hardware that is supposed to be compatible with previous releases. So you make uh, contracts 
with hardware vendors, they promise you to deliver the very same hardware for 20 years, for 25 years, but then after 10 years or so, you realize some minor detail that they didn't really bother um, even informing you about has changed, which may require major modifications of your software stack, which again, in turn, is a very involved thing because say you need to backport a device driver over 10 years worth of kernel updates with device model changes, with core kernel changes, and so on. Good luck with that. So really try to ensure hardware stability. In the first case, that is, um, that is one of the preconditions for building extremely long-lasting systems. The third point is somewhat related. Sometimes people think a lot about how to ensure that they can resupply hardware for 25 years, but then they just build a USB port onto their device, and that basically eliminates all these efforts because you can uh, plug in new hardware, hardware that the device has never seen before, into the system, and that's the same as a um, changing hardware basis. So make sure that really both of these conditions are fulfilled. Even um, if you are on the left-hand side of all these questions, there's still... Uh, so if you are on the left-hand side of these questions, then basically things um, are fine or are a good basis to build long-term maintain maintainable architectures. Um, but there's two more points that need to be considered. One is um, the verification and safety requirements. Um, and uh, the other thing is the cost sensitivity of your devices. Say, if you are not, or if your cost pressure is not all too high, if you can afford um, to, to, um, to use hardware that offers more computational power than the task actually provides, then this relaxes the, this relaxes um, the assumptions or the, um, the requirements for long-term maintenance a bit because uh, you get quite interesting architectural alternatives. You can run your core payload inside virtual environments. I said that hardware stability and that a, a stable hardware basis is essential in my experience, but if you manage to move your appliance into a virtual machine, then basically you don't care about what your real hardware basis is. You just let the appliance run in your VM. The VM always provides um, a simulated or a virtualized set of hardware, and then you just use the uh, best commodity product that's available, the cheapest one, to run your virtualized hardware. Of course, this needs to be um, this needs to be brought in sync with any certification requirements that you have, with any safety requirements that you have. This is a non-trivial process when you're speaking of uh, virtual systems versus real physical systems with the certification authorities at the moment, but the problem is one that can be addressed on the social level and is not really a core technical issue. So moving on. Another question that um, needs to be addressed when you think about long-term maintainable systems is what types of risk should your long-term strategy actually prevent? So why do you want your system to stay more or less unchanged on the market for quite a long while? And there's uh, one fairly obvious reason you want to prevent your device um, that it stops working. Um, so you want to be able, even in the, when the device produces a fault, then the device, um, when the software on the device um, contains bugs that you didn't fix um, before delivering the device, you want to make sure that you can fix these bugs and eliminate these problems 10, 15, 20 years after delivery. That's, of course, a, a thing that goes without saying. The same is, or more or less the same is that um, you want to prevent that faults in the device cannot be repaired anymore or that the device can be um, influenced from the outside. So these are all... Um, so these, these, are all, um, these are all things that call for a changeability of the device after decades of operation. Uh, maybe the influencing... Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, no, no, sorry, sorry. So that, that, call, uh, that call for changeability after, after decades. One reason 
um, that, in my opinion, is actually not worth going for with a long-term maintenance approach is if you want to prepare the device for changed expectations on the customer side, on the user side. Say you uh, build an appliance that works perfectly fine uh, on the day you deliver it to your customers and then uh, 15, 20 years later customers um, have developed different expectations to devices. Say you're using an information screen that um, displays information as it's intended to do, but then customers want to have touch screens, customers want to have nicer UIs, customers want to have 3D graphics, and um, your, um, your salespeople obviously will always <laughs> want to fulfill these customer needs, but um, it does not make any sense to prepare for such uh, commodity changes or convenient ch con convenience changes in the design of a system, that's more a case when you rip out a component of the system, of the long-term system, and replace it by something different. Of course, when a failure or a problem of uh, the type um, I said here occurs, you have a number of responses how a company, how a manufacturer can react to such problems. Um, yeah, replacing the device with a different hardware software combination or replacing a whole um, the whole component is of course one possible way to go. Another possible way to go that we often see is you just ignore the issues, which is of course usually not what you want. It can be reasonable under very specific circumstances, especially if you have contracts with the customer that state that um, the device is not supposed to operate and um, say beyond uh, beyond a certain time frame, then it's not your problem, but that's more um, a legal thing. The, um, the interesting case is, of course, the interesting option is, of course, w um, when you want to modify the software to get the device in working shape again. And that then requires changes to the system, requires backporting, requires component changes. That's where it becomes interesting if you don't do that after five years or after 10 years, but after 15 years when um, the complete landscape is different than it used to be when you build the device. Coming to the um, technical aspects or to the software architectural aspects that you need to take into account during device design phase that will enable you 15 years later to still change uh, the software in a way that um, um, that you can fix the aforementioned issues. And actually, it's quite interesting when you look into the software engineering literature um, and see what the researchers and what, what guidelines people have come up with uh, producing maintainable software, then it's mostly commonplaces. That's in the textbook. It's like, um, yeah, you properly structure your software into modules. You make sure that um, build systems are used, you make sure that everything is well documented, but that has more or less, that is not, that is just um, general good software engineering practice and is not so much related to long-term maintaining systems. What I find um, is most crucial for the long-term maintenance of systems is three points. The most important of them being to minimize any cross-cutting issues in the software design itself. So avoid issues that concern multiple subsystems, multiple components, and so on, where you need where you introduce some coupling of knowledge. Because even if in the original development teams, people with the appropriate um, skill set, with the combined skill sets for these um, issues have been available, then um, this will be completely different a decade or two after you've created the device. And especially such cross-cutting issues cause couplings, cause unintended um, cause unintended connections in the software architecture that are very hard to reconstruct um, once the original um, designers and the original implementers are not available anymore, which is a thing that you, of course, need to assume when uh, you deal with time spans that we're talking about. This can um, be done by harmonizing the technical and social organization. That's quite a big word, but actually that's more or less common sense. 
Um, what you do if you have people with clear responsibilities for clear components, then you won't be introducing these cross-cutting issues into your software architecture at all. You may call that um, Conway's law, if you like. That's an uh, Four decades old wisdom in software engineering, but again, it's um, mostly mostly um, common sense. And what's also very important is to make sure that you keep a meaningful and reproducible history of how you developed your system. Again, that's um, a common place for kernel developers. That's a common place for most base layer software packages that you find these days in Linux system. People take real good care about um, making proper, com uh, proper uh, patch stacks, about properly documenting their contributions to software. But that's far from, um, that's far from um, universally uh, done in commercial industrial software development. So um, yeah, adopting the best practices from the Linux kernel community, from other communities in the OSS movement really helps here because, uh, as you all know, architecture documentation tends to get lost over time, design documentations tend to get lost over time, but if you manage to keep your development histories, your proper development histories, then it becomes actually feasible to reconstruct these original architectural considerations that you want to preserve. Um, one major point in, uh, for the software architecture I already mentioned a number of times, and that's the connectivity issue. You should really, 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 really think three times before you um, equip your device with a connection to the internet or some other network. And once you've finished thinking three times about whether you should do that or not, you should maybe again think three more times if that really pays off or not. And if you do this thinking properly, you will realize that in almost all cases, irregardless of what the um, Internet of Things people tell you and what update over the air people tell you and um, what the proponents of web-based solutions tell you, the benefits that you get for a product by introducing it, by introducing network connectivity to it, usually very much outweigh um, the costs that are associated with it in terms of security, in terms of, um, uh, in terms of uh, undesired access, and so on. Another thing that's uh, very important when you design software architectures for long-term maintenance systems based on open source components is um, that you have a translator in form of a person so uh, someone who knows both the, arc the, um, the domain that you're building your product for, who knows the custom requirements, who knows um, what the device um, is required to deliver in terms of features and so on, but that also knows how the software communities work that, um, so to speak, deliver the components that go into the product because that usually, that usually helps to correct some wrong assumptions about the guarantees that components make, about the guarantees that long-term releases make, um, about the way how you use these components in the first place. Uh, it's, still, it's still very easy or it's still, still very common to employ, to see products where software products, where, um, sorry, where uh, OSS-based components are deployed in a way that were never really intended by their original communities, uh, mostly related to, to web things, to stuff like Node.js that was never intended, for instance, to be used in anything that's um, updated less than every two weeks. But um, still, you find that used in many systems that are supposed to last for years because the designers of the architectures um, were not really aware of the mindset of the communities of the um, yeah, of the communities that uh, they uh, that they base their um, components on. And what also more or less goes without saying is, yeah, you should of course make components runtime replaceable if you run into an issue with a certain component, make sure you can replace it without um, touching the kernel, without touching the base layers of your system. And one um, really good way or one, uh, one advice that I find um, really worth giving in that respect is that you should these days prefer user-land solutions to in-kernel solutions whenever you can. 
Um, this is these days possible with more and more devices, with more and more classes of devices. Um, of course, using user lens device drivers, using user lens access mechanisms to systems hardware will not always deliver the best performance results, will not always um, deliver 100% of the capabilities that uh, these devices can provide then they are driven by a, a proper kernel device driver. But um, if you are intending to build a system that is supposed to last for decades, then it's maybe anyway the wrong choice to drive hardware up to its maximum capability um, and leave a little a gap, um, a little safety gap in there. Another thing um, that provides a endless line of problems or fun, depending on how you want to call it, um, to systems that are on the market for a long while is to rebuild the systems from source code after 10, after 15, after 20 years they've last been built. Building, of course, is something that people usually don't take much interest in. It's hard enough to do, and once it works, um, once you produce binaries out of it, people are satisfied. But when you think about um, how hard it is, how hard it often is to produce bin binaries um, at development time, then it of course becomes clear that this will be even harder 20 years after the first launch of your product, because um, in build systems, there's often a lot of experts or a, a lot of expert knowledge uh, is implicitly required to build systems that, um, is, that is obvious to all developers who originally work on the system, but that is basically unrecoverable after um, 20 years of bit rot that has been observed by the system. So um, you need to spend special efforts to ensure that the payload application plus all modifiable system components that um, uh, often gets forgotten because this comes from distributions and that is just some binary that you install. But of course, uh, all these distribution installation mechanisms will have ceased to work after 20 years. So you need to make sure that both the payload application and the modified modifiable system components are in a buildable state, which again is quite simple to achieve but often overlooked. So you preserve um, your document, uh, documentation is really the key, including documentation of seemingly trivial um, details. And you also need to make sure that the documentation stays available for decades. And um, while, <laughs> of course, nobody really likes to pay, work with paper these days anymore, having hard copies of um, the respective documentation can really help you because if you go back 20 years in time, then maybe some um, uh, genius may have come up with the idea of uh, providing the documentation in Windows help files or in um, um, in Army Word or in some format that you just cannot um, open reliably these days anymore. So the simpler the format that provides the documentation, the better that is. Uh, speaking of um, building systems, another point that is relevant is the availability of source code. It's, of course, very simple to just produce a tarball of the state of your application at um, the stage when it was delivered to the market. But as you all know, the application is not just made up of the application code itself, but also of, um, contains lots of libraries, lots of dependencies. And when you look into build systems, they have uh, dependency specifications, especially with um, you have the more modern scripting-based languages that can specify constraints on the revisions that you need to use. But these constraints, um, in my experience, often fail to live up the um, the promises they deliver. So just stating that you need a revision higher than blah blah dot something of one package does not really guarantee that um, this will also work with really all higher revisions. So and um, uh, for many libraries that are not um, exactly in the spotlight that are used less frequently. Um, the availability of the source code, even if 
uh, it has been on the internet in some publicly accessible repository can be quite troublesome even after five or only after ten years. So um, it's, it's quite essential to make sure that you have copies of every library of every uh, dependency that you need to build your system. And that, of course, also includes the build infrastructure. In general, when it comes um, when it comes to using or when it comes to dependencies in software products, um, you need to consider when you use libraries that li uh, so the textbook knowledge about libraries is of course libraries are fine libraries to solve things libraries. Um, make it possible to share development efforts for common tasks in software engineering. But the point that is quite often overlooked is that libraries come at a cost. Libraries come at a massive cost because libraries um, require other libraries. Libraries require other dependencies. Um, libraries often silently change. If, uh, so, of course, that doesn't hold for the... Um, for the well-tended system libraries like the libc or things like that, but the more arcane and the more abstruse your libraries get, the less people are interested in really um, providing proper um, version compatibility. So the amount of experiences you face uh, with libraries uh, and with a slight compatibility with problems with libraries can become really tremendous. Now, when you build a system that's supposed to last for decades, you, you, um, you, need to, um, you need to very precisely distinguish between the prototype that you are um, actually de of the, the uh, development um, version of the system that you're doing when you do experiments, when you say you try different algorithms, you try different um, approaches to solving problems, you play with libraries, you have 17 different ways of solving one problem, and the um, state that you ship to a product. So consider you've used 17 machine learning algorithms to solve one particular type of problem, then you will, in the end of the day, um, arrive with one that you use in your product. And you should really consider, um, once you find the code that fits your needs, to rewrite this code and get rid of library dependencies. If you're using, say, uh, GNU R to solve your machine learning problems, then experience shows you install one library that pulls in 25 other system libraries uh, that pull in even more dependencies. And of the 500 lines of code that you actually need, uh, you produce maybe 50,000 lines of code that become a maintenance burden for your system. Okay, so coming um, to the coming um, to the end, um, when it comes to we've we've already heard um, in the previous sessions a lot about the qualities and lesser qualities of board support packages. Um, and that is a, one point that I just can reiterate. So when you develop your, your products, even if they are supposed to last for three or four decades, make sure that during development you develop, you always develop against the latest um, head revisions or the latest available revisions of your software packages. Develop against the mainline state, rebase the changes that you do against the mainline state and try to stay uh, contemporary as much as possible during development. Especially you want, to, uh, you want to do that with the Linux kernel when it comes to embedded devices. We all know that many embedded devices require um, vendor board support packages, but that's actually what the exact opposite of what you want. You want a working device, and you want your working device not provided by uh, these uh, one point something million line changes that SOC vendors often supply to you. You don't want board support packages. You want board support. You want support in the upstream Linux kernel. And why I'm stressing this point so much is that there is um, actually one chance to get this board support instead of board support packages, and that is prior to purchasing the um, 10 to the something units um, of the hardware that you want to ship with your device. So if you don't make the efforts 
of convincing your um, your SOC manufacturers to provide you an appropriate uh, base system in that appropriate form during development, then you will have lost this chance forever. Um, and then anyone anyone who has supported board support packages or who has tried to port a, a board support package to a new kernel revision that was maybe even three or five years also far away from um, the time, ran time ranges we are talking about knows that this is basically the end to all um, long-term uh, long support um, um, efforts. Good, I'm going to skip a few slides and Yeah, I'm going to. Okay, no time has, has progressed even further than I had um, expected it to be. Let me come right, um, right to the end of my talk. I would have had to say a few more things about um, designing software for base, uh, um, about uh, working with um, with upstream component providers. But you'll see that in the uh, slides that I'll put online. Let me come um, to the wish list to my wish list, um, a list of things that could improve the um, situation for uh, long-term maintainable system providers when it comes to picking changes, to backporting changes that occur in the active development branches of the underlying projects and to bring them back to these long-term maintained systems. The major complication that we face when um, um, when we need to update systems that have been in the field for a long while is the problem um, of how to select um, patches from the um, from the action from the the ongoing development, and that's a problem that's. Um, far from solved so what would be the what would be the desirable thing of course is if you could automatically track the upstream development that's going on um, in the base projects and then find some way uh, some some magic way of getting a list of uh, commits out that need to be backported that would be possible in theory but uh, and there are there is actually some research going on to achieve this goal, but I doubt that this will, um, in any realistic time frame, deliver mechanisms that actually work in practice. So um, the the human factor, the human, um, the expert selection, the expert, um, yeah, the expert selection of patches that need to be backported, um, is basically unreplaceable. So the best thing one can do is to avoid duplicated efforts to ha um, to avoid having experts in different companies doing the same work over and over again to do the same work of um, selecting patches of interest for different projects, and the situation I guess could be improved quite a bit if um, patches were. Um, by the upstream projects already pre-characterized into different maintenance classes or into classes that uh, into uh, so if uh, so uh, basically the patches would need to be annotated if they are um, if there are candidates for backporting some of the larger projects of course already do that but most of uh, the projects don't and it would be quite helpful to also have applicability ranges in terms of the previous releases that the patches would um, would apply to um, would apply to because of course when the when some development has been um, going on then there are patches that only concern subsystems that have not been available in older releases and so uh, you also don't you don't need to check if um, you also um, you can you can um, in the first place avoid um, looking at these patches because they surely won't apply anyway Okay, so um, yeah, summarizing, I think that um, the long-term maintenance best practices for development are very similar to when you do proper open source um, style development anyway. A thing that's obvious to open source communities, but that's not obvious to the uh, traditional engineering providers. And so um, traditional engineering can learn quite a lot from the open source communities in that respect. 
Um, providing long-term maintainable systems is definitely not rocket science, but um, it's still more of an art than a science. You've heard uh, me saying a lot, in my opinion, I think that and that is good. It's actually really hard to come up with quantifiable numbers, but it's definitely a topic that needs to be addressed in the future, and we will need to find ways um, to quantify to quantify these decisions and to make these decisions more based on uh, objective criteria than on gut feeling and experience, because we will be seeing a lot more long-term um, relevant devices in the future. So with that, um, I'd like to thank you for your interest and your attention. And I don't know if there's room for questions. Do we have questions? None. Then, um, yeah, thanks again.